You know, two weeks ago, we took a Bible knowledge test, and we know how we felt about our scores on that. Uh, Two weeks ago, we took a spiritual disciplines test, where we saw that our actions don't always match up to our beliefs. Uh, Two weeks ago, we took a Christian character test, where we learned that we have a pretty high opinion of ourselves at times. You know, but, but as you're going through all those tests that we took, I mean, there were, there were a ton of questions through all those things, and, and there's so much information, and last week we talked about all the places that we could start, all the things that need to be changed. At times, it, it can just be overwhelming. You know, at, at, at some point you say, well, can you just narrow it down some for me? Okay, with all of that information, all those things that God wants us to do and he wants us to be, is there a way that you can just bring it down to something I can deal with? Well, Jesus did that in the Sermon on the Mount. The sermon is a summary of all the stuff that the Bible teaches. Beyond that, uh, he, he makes a statement in there that just really gets down to the heart of Christianity. And this morning, just a, a little bit of background, I, I was really inspired by part of a chapter I read of a book by Lee Strobel uh, from God's Outrageous Claims. And so the inspiration for a lot of this came from that as I was studying. And we're going to look at what Jesus said uh, this morning in Matthew chapter 7. And so if you have a Bible, turn to Matthew 7. If you don't, there should be one of the chairs in front of you. Uh, you can look it up on your iPad, your tablet, your phone, whatever, pretty easily. Uh, or if you brought your own Bible, uh, Matthew's kind of about three-fourths away through the Bible, uh, right before the book of Mark. Matthew chapter 7, I'm going to read part of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, starting with verse 9. Matthew 7, 9, Jesus is talking and he says this, Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. So Jesus is talking about the way that we are supposed to behave, the way we're supposed to act. And he says, hey, dads, if your kid asks you for a piece of bread, do you say, well, well certainly, son, here, here's a rock. Gnaw on this for a while. <laughs> He's like, no. If your kid asks you for a gift, you're going to give him a good gift. And how much more so is God going to take care of us? God's a significantly better father than I am. That's what he's saying. But then he, he goes on and he says, okay, so, he says, even though you know how to do this, it, here, here's kind of the bottom line. In everything that you do, do to others what you would have them do to you. That is called the golden rule. This morning, we're going to look at what the golden rule is. Do to others what you would have them do to you. We're going to look at that, examine that. We're going to start with the history of the golden rule. If you fill out sermon notes, there's a little spaces in there. The history of the golden rule. People are going to try and tell you that the golden rule has been a long, it's been around a long time since before Christianity. And they'll cite things like this. They'll say 500 years before Jesus was even around, Confucius said, what you do not want done to yourself, do not do to others. Or 400 years before Jesus, a philosopher in Athens said this, whatever angers you when you suffer at the hands of others, do not do that to them. Or even 20 years before Jesus, uh, there was a a really famous Jewish rabbi named Hillel. And there was a young man that that came to Hillel and said, hey, I am ready to convert to Judaism. Uh, And I'll do it on, on one condition. If you can explain the law to me, if you can explain the Bible to me while I'm standing on one leg... And so the guy's point was, I don't want you to spend the next 20 years explaining to me what the Bible, I want you to sum the thing up, give me a summary statement. And so Hillel says to him, what is hateful to yourself, do to no other. That is the whole law, and the rest is commentary. And so they're kind of saying the same thing uh, uh, throughout time. They're saying, uh, what you don't want people to do to you, don't do that to others. And that's kind of the summary. Well, Jesus came along, and Jesus changed everything. He turned it all upside down. You see, the negative versions that I just said there, the negative versions of the golden rule are based on selfish reciprocity. And what that means is, I'm not going to hurt you because I hope that in return, you don't hurt me. 
I'm not going to say something harmful or, or do something bad to you because I'm hoping in the same way you won't do those things to me. Well, that's just protecting yourself. There's nothing admirable, admirable about that. Everybody does that. I mean, that's just self-centeredness guiding our actions. Well, then what is what Jesus said different? What is the meaning of the golden rule? What is it meaning? Well, it may not sound like a big difference, but look at what he said. You know, those teachers are saying, what you don't want people to do to you, don't, don't be mean, basically. And Jesus said, that's way too easy. Just not being mean to other people, that's too easy. Because what that means is, you can be a lazy bum, sit around your house all day long, never interact with anyone, and you're not being mean to them. Okay, well, who doesn't want to do that? Jesus said, if you're my follower, I want you to be proactive. I want you to leave your house, and when you get out into the world with people, I don't want you to be mean to them, absolutely, but I want you to go and I want you to do good to other people. The things that you wish that they would do for you, that's the attitude. You go and you do that for other people. You see how it's just totally the opposite. Well, what kind of things? Whatever you want someone to do for you in that situation. And Jesus wasn't saying just kind of randomly. Just, you know, because we have this thing of random acts of kindness, and it's supposed to be these wonderful things that we do. And uh, there's even, I don't know if you knew this or not, but there's a week of random acts of kindness. And during that, they play music. <laughs> and so, um, <laughs> they don't. I'm just making that part up. Um, <laughs> wouldn't that be cool, though, if you did a random act of kindness and, like, music started playing? <laughs> That'd be awesome. Um, Jesus said it's not about a week where we're nice to people. It's about a lifestyle. And see, that part of the golden rule, that's easy to understand. All we have to do is use our, our imagination a little bit, put ourselves in the other person's shoes, and ask, how would I want to be treated in that situation? You know, you, school started recently for, for a lot of you young people. <laughs> school started, and uh, at school, you know, a lot of kids eat lunch. If you see someone sitting at a table by themselves, you need to think, what would I want someone to do for me in that situation? Or, or maybe you go to the grocery store, and you, you take your groceries out to your car, and, and you've got the cart left over, and you're looking around for a cart rack, and there's one, like, way over there in Egypt. And you're going, dude, that's just way too far to walk. I'm just going to set it here to the side. And I know that it's in other people's way, and I know, but I know that they pay someone to come and move these, and so it's not that big a deal. What would you want other people to do? If you were someone that else that had a car in the middle of the parking lot, would you want that cart near your car? Because you know what happens. If you're someone that works there, do you want to go and gather the carts from everywhere, or do you want people to put them where they're supposed to go? But, but that's his job. Well, that's not the point. The point is, if you were the employee or the other person parking out there, what would you want someone to do with that cart when they're done with it? Or maybe you're talking about your spouse. Maybe you want to do something special for your spouse, and so you throw them this huge, nice, all over-the-top surprise party. You know, they walk in the door, and there's a crowd of people. They're like, surprise! And then you're like, oh my gosh, you know, you did this for me. And at the end of the day, after you've gone through all that time, all that work, you're talking to your spouse, and, and you, you know, you're proud of yourself because you're like, man, I did all this stuff for you. And your spouse is like, you know, you know I don't like surprise parties. You know that, that for me, one of the, old, the best things that you could do for me is just a, a nice, quiet getaway. And so the question was, you throwing the surprise party for your spouse, was it for you or was it for them? Because you like surprise parties, and so you assume that they do too. But the golden rule says, whatever it is that you want other people to do for you, you put yourself in the other person's shoes. What do they want? How can you love them the best? See, in the golden rule, it forces you to take the initiative. You know, it's kind of like going on the compassion offensive by deliberately choosing to act kindly to people in every situation. There's a Christian writer, his name is uh, uh, D.A. Carson. He says, if you enjoy being loved, love other people. If you like to receive things, then go give to others. If you like to be appreciated, then go show your appreciation to other people. 
No, if, if you own a car, let's just say you own a car, um, which a lot of us do, uh, the, the negative version of the golden rule just says, don't run over people in your car, okay? Don't get drunk and drive. Those are good things. And the golden rule says, yes, don't do those bad things. But beyond that, if you have a car, you need to take it a step further. When you know that someone needs a ride, you offer it to them. When you know there's a widow down the street who, who needs to get to church, you make yourself available. You make an effort to look for ways to serve people in ways that you would want them to serve you. The golden rule, it makes us really examine ourselves. See, because most of us think of ourselves as really good people. As a matter of fact, if you ask people, uh, just in general, are you going to heaven? Most people say, oh, absolutely, I'm going to heaven. Why are you going to heaven? Well, I'm a pretty good person. Well, may, may, what makes you a good person? Well, I haven't killed anyone. And it's hilarious because that's the gold standard for goodness. And people think, if I just haven't killed them. So I looked it up. I looked it up, and, and, and the best I could figure out on, on how many people have actually killed someone in the United States of America. And there, it's like... It's, it's hard to find a number, but I'm going with this one. Uh, it, it's about one out of 40,000 people have killed someone. So when you're saying, I'm a pretty good person, I haven't killed anyone, um, what you're saying is, I can be 39,999, and I'm getting in. That's your standard of goodness? Do you see how crazy that is? Well, I'm 39,999. God better let me in, because I'm pretty good. As followers of Jesus Christ, we can do better. James 4.12 says this, Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. If you're walking along and you see someone and, and there's a need and, and you just look at them and go, and, and you, you feel that voice inside, you feel that compulsion to go and do something, and then another part of you says, well, they would just, it would take too much time, it would take too much effort, I might get sweaty, I might get dirty, I might be late. And so you have this urge to go and do something good for them, and you ignore it and you walk on. The Bible says that's a sin. The Bible says that's a sin. And that, that's significantly higher standard than just not killing someone. And the golden rule makes us examine ourselves. And if we're honest, at the end of the day, there's probably a lot of times that we will go through a day and we'll see someone in need and we feel that, compassion, that compulsion to do something and we ignore it. Well, if that's the meaning of the golden rule, let's we'll see if we can make it happen. Well, how about the practice of the golden rule? If, if, if we practice, can you imagine if everybody practiced the golden rule, do unto others what you'd want them to do to you? Can you imagine what our world would look like? I mean, we wouldn't have to lock our cars or our houses ever because people wouldn't go and steal stuff because we know that that's not something that we want done to us. You know, you, you go back to the old days. We could send our kids to the park and let them play there for hours, and we would just take a nap at home, knowing that they're safe. You know, what, what would it be like to live in a world full of forgiveness and compassion and peace and goodwill? But that's not happening, is it? It's not happening. Why not? I think there are four main problems that cause us not to follow the golden rule. And the first problem is we get distracted by life. You know, I think on Sunday morning, we'll hear something like this, and we're like, you know what? Man, I'm going to do this. I'm going to practice this golden rule. I'm going to look for people that I can, I can practice this with. On Sunday morning, we do a great job. But then life happens, and we have a bad day, or we get crabby, or we get distracted, and we forget about following God. It's kind of like the lady in California that, that got pulled over by a cop. She had, as he pulled her over, he sees on her bumper sticker says, peace. Well, he pulled her over, because there was, she was following this truck on a two-lane road. He was going really slow, so she was right up on his bumper. And when, that, that, when he wasn't moving fast enough, she took out an aluminum bat, swung it at the truck, took a can of air freshener, threw it at the truck, and yelled at him as she was finally able to get around him, and she sped off. Well, the cop saw this and was talking to her, gave her the ticket, and then he asked her, as he's giving her the ticket, he said, that bumper sticker on the back of your car, it says, Peace. Why do you have that? She said, I put that on there because I feel like there's too much violence in, in society today. <laughs> I, 
I totally believe she had the right intentions when she bought the sticker and she put it on and she wanted to promote peace up until the time that that life happened. And then it's like, it kind of goes out the window. So the first problem is we get distracted by life and so we don't practice the golden rule. The second problem is, is just our sin and selfishness. It's our sin and selfishness. We don't practice, we don't live it out because we are so focused on what we want. Lee Strobel said it, he said, I said, in a world that all too frequently revolves around me, I have to purposefully reorient my attitude on a regular basis if I'm ever going to follow this teaching of Jesus. You know, that's one of the big reasons that we pray and read the Bible on a daily basis. It's not so we can say, hey God, spend some time with you today. Make sure you check that off, okay, me and you. The reason that, one of the reasons we read the Bible and pray is so that we can reorient our attitude and realize that the world does not revolve around us and that we can live out these type of things. The third problem is, with following the golden rule, is that we just tend to rebel against God's laws. Whatever God's laws are, we tend to do just the opposite. Romans chapter 8 verse 7 says this, the sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. That's us. Our sinful mind is, is just the opposite of God. Do you ever, do you, I mean, do you have that problem? When, when you're in a store or something and you see a sign that says, do not touch, my immediate reaction is? That's the, whether I do it or not, my first instinct is to, oh, it says don't touch. Well, I absolutely, that's what I want to do. And we're the same with God's law. God says, don't do this. Well, I'm going to go do that. Or God says, go and do this. Well, I don't think I'm going to do that. We tend to rebel against God's laws. The fourth problem we have is that this following of the golden rule is not something that we can accomplish on our own. Okay? Uh, if you're watching the Olympics at all, uh, those, those weightlifter dudes, oh my goodness. I mean, they're picking up bars of weights and this huge, thick metal bar is bending under the weights, and he gets it over his head. Now, if you can imagine trying to lift 1,000 pounds over your head like that, those dudes, the, rec the record's like 580 pounds. If you can imagine one of us trying to lift 1,000 pounds over our head and, not, and like living through the experience, okay, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. We can't do it physically on our own. Well, the same thing is true spiritually. In following the golden rule, Romans 8, 7 says this, the sinful mind is, is hostile to God. We just read that. It doesn't submit to God's law. We just read that. Nor can it do so. We can't do this under our own power. We've got to have God's spirit in us. You might be able to do some act of kindness at some time on, on an occasional basis, but this lifestyle of doing for others what you want them to do for you that Jesus is promoting... It's not something we can handle on our own. That's why, that's one of the reasons why we need Christ in our lives. To carry out the commands that God has given us. And as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ, guess what? When you became a follower of Jesus Christ, his spirit moved in. His spirit moved in with you and gives you the power and the ability to follow these commands of God. And so if you are a follower of Christ now, it's not just you that's working, okay? It's not your spirit that's working only. It's also God's spirit. And God's spirit, slightly more powerful than yours. A thousand pounds, doesn't even blink at a thousand pounds. Loving people that are jerks towards you, God can do that. Look at what Jesus did. Jesus was on the cross nailed to the cross, looks down at the people that did it, looks down at the people that are yelling at him, taunting him, mocking him, looks at those people and says, Father, forgive them. Because at some point, Jesus said, what would I want to do in their situation? And we look at that, and we try and put that into our real life and say, well, someone did something to me that was incredibly hurtful, and I'll tell you what, I don't want to forgive them. I want, I want them to get run over by a truck because that's what they deserve. And God says, flip that around. 
flip it around. Do to other people what you'd want them to have, what you would want them to have do to you. And so, if you have ever hurt somebody, if you have ever betrayed somebody, do you want that person to forgive you? Yeah, I do. Well, then you offer that type of forgiveness to someone else. And you're like, Brian, you don't understand. You don't understand what they did. You don't understand the, the extent of the things that happened. And you know what? I don't. I, 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 there's a really good chance I don't know what you went through. But I do know this. Jesus went through a lot worse than you did. And he told us, if you're going to be my follower, this is what it's going to be. If you want to be a follower of Christ, this is not like an optional thing. Well, I'll take, you know, six of the peace and the patience and all those things, but this I'll love someone as do to them what I want them to. I'm going to skip that. That's not an option. It's not an option. So God can give you the power to make this happen, but you've got to let him. You've got to let him work in you so that he can work through you to other people. Now, it's something that you can choose to do. But it's something, it's a package deal. If you go on in this passage in Matthew, Matthew 7, uh, 13, Jesus says this kind of at the end of this. He says this, Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. Jesus says basically this, Hey, getting to heaven, it's a narrow road. Not a lot of people are taking this path. But if you want to get to heaven, here's what you do. You do the things that God commanded. Why is it such a narrow path? Because people hear stuff like this, like forgive someone that hurts you, and they're like, well, I'm not going to do that. And Jesus says, well, well that, that's the wide path. Everybody doesn't forgive people. If you want to get to heaven, you want to follow me, be my follower, you take the narrow path. You do the stuff that's hard. And yeah, you can't do it on your own, and that's okay. God will give you the power to make it happen. But these are the types of choices that you have to make. And if you don't want to make these choices, that's fine. That's up to you, but you're taking the broad way. And that leads to destruction. Jesus is giving you a warning. Here's where you're going. Man, isn't that crazy? Do to others what you would have them do to you. Something so small, something so simple, and yet it's so hard to do. Thinks that, I think that's why God gives us grace. I think that's why he gives us mercy. He knows that when we first try and do this stuff, we're going to fail and fail miserably. But he stays with us. He stays by us. And he wants us to continue to grow and mature in him until we get to the place we can do these things. It's what God has called us to do. And so whatever it is that you encounter this week, do to other people, what you want them to do to you. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you put, <laughs> put your word in the Bible and make it easy to understand. And God, we also know that this is hard stuff to do. And so we thank you that you give us the power to do it because we can't do this stuff on our own. God, thank you that you sent your son to die in our place when we can't do the things that you've commanded. We thank you for your mercy and your grace and I pray that we will understand those things and accept them and to live them out by sharing them with other people. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. It's now time for communion. In a few moments, the servers will be passing the trays which will have the bread and the juice which represents Jesus' body and blood. We invite each of you to take communion with us this morning. When you're finished, you can put your little cup and the chair bottom in front of you. Why do we do communion? What is communion? We know it's the juice and the, and the bread, but what does it? What is it exactly and why do we do it? Well, one, Jesus tells us to do it. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11 what communion is and what Jesus says about it. For I receive from the Lord what I... What I, 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 I for I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in, in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. 
For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So here it describes what communion is and what it represents. And, and it tells us that Jesus asks us to do this in remembrance of him. But what are we remembering? What does he want us to remember about him? He wants us to remember what he did for us on the cross. He wants us to remember his life, his example. He wants us to remember him and what he wants us to do and how he taught us, the teachings that he taught us. Isaiah 53, 5, I think, says it really well, what he did on the cross. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crucified for our inequities. The, t the punishment that broke us, brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. What he did for the us on the cross gives us the chance to have eternal life. He took our punishment on that cross so that we could spend eternity with him. So whatever you're holding today, your sins, your shortcomings, he's paid the price. You just have to accept the gift that he gave us on the cross. By his wounds, we are healed. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this plan that you set up so before the world ever began to send your son to die in our place for our sins because you knew that we could never live up to those expectations, that we never could live up to Jesus. And only he was pure enough to take our place. We thank you, Jesus, for coming and taking that upon us, on yourself, for us. We love you for what you did for us. We can never repay you, and you don't ask us to. Thank you for the gift of grace. Thank you for the gift of salvation. Thank you for the gift of eternity. It's in your precious son's name we pray. Amen. Yeah.